right, we're right at 12. So for anybody who has joined the webinar, uh, we're just going to give it another minute or two, let some folks join, and we'll get started in just a minute. Thank you for joining. All right, everybody, we're one minute past the 12 o'clock mark and to make sure that we get the most out of this uh, hour that we've got with our team. I'm going to go ahead and get us kicked off. This is a uh, webinar focused on a case study that was recently published by the Arch Collaborative um, where we partnered uh, Divergent and Baptist Health of Jacksonville partnered to launch an e-learning program. Um, we're going to have more from the team on that topic, but I'm just going to get us kicked off. Um, thank you for joining us today. We're excited to have everybody here. Uh, this recording or this is being recorded. We'll be able to share it uh, for anybody who wasn't able to attend. But um, if you are here, and you've got the emails about the Grubhub lunch. Here's some details on that. If you've not used that platform before with our team, you should have gotten an email prompt on that. Uh, if you have used it before, then you can just log in, see that line of credit. Uh, and of course, if you're having any troubles, please reach out to Megan Aylesworth at Divergent.com and she'll get you set up, um, hopefully very shortly after the webinar. Um, before we get started, I just want to announce that while we can't engage with um, our webinar members on video or phone, we do have a Q&A open, so please use that. I'll make an announcement uh, once I pass the mic over to COIN um, to let you know where that is. It, sh it looks like a little Q&A chat bubble um, in the Teams uh, live event. So please use that. We welcome questions. We're going to tackle them all at the end of the webinar. So. Um, sit back, relax, enjoy the webinar, and then bring your questions at the end, and we'll make sure that we try to get to all of them, and if we don't, we'll follow up afterwards um, with the answers. So thank you for joining, and I'm going to pass it over to COIN with Divergent. Thank you so much, Brittany. I appreciate that. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on if you're on the central time <laughs> or Pacific. My name is Koi Nashikoya and I'm a manager with Divergent and I'm here working alongside my client partner, Cameron Chambers. We're going to just be talking today about how we how we redefined e-learning at Baptist Health Jacksonville. So to give a short background, I'll turn it over to Cameron. Thank you so much, Coin. Uh, again, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. My name is Cameron Chambers and I am the Clinical Systems Training and Development Manager here at Baptist Health Jacksonville. Um, so in short, everything that is related to provider EMR or EHR education on the Cerner platform uh, falls under my direction. So just a brief background about Baptist Health. Uh, Baptist is Northeast Florida's largest health system, which includes five major hospitals, across the city and four freestanding emergency services centers. Uh, Baptist Health is also uh, very uh, abundant in ambulatory space. So we have ambulatory centers scattered across Northeast Florida for primary care and specialty care use. We currently have over uh, 1,600 licensed beds and Jacksonville's largest health employer is Baptist Health Jacksonville. And uh, just to summarize, uh, we currently have over 1,600 physicians that are currently practicing here at Baptist Health, and we have 88 adult and pediatric specialties um, that are scattered across the organization. I think we're good to go. Perfect. All right. So uh, just to pretty much summarize the partnership between Baptist Health and Divergent. So Baptist Health partnered with Divergent early 2020, right before COVID struck, uh, to prepare for the transition from our current EHR platform, which is Cerner, uh, to our new platform, which is going to be Epic. 
the goal of the partnership was to uh, transition our class from training to online e-learning modules that would be housed in our uh, learning management system platform, which is Cornerstone. Uh, we also wanted to decrease onboarding time for providers, so taking away that four to 12 hour initial classroom time frame and condensing it into e-learning modules and also for focus on uh, increasing the personalization of order entry, documentation, and other specific workflows that were related to uh, the providers. Um, unfortunately, COVID did strike around March of 2020, and that did uh, increase the pace for the need for remote training options um, here at Baptist Health. Next slide. All right, perfect. So how did we approach this specific situation? So we performed an assessment at Baptist Health after speaking with leadership to kind of get an idea of what the desires were and also what some of the pain points were. So we started off with some stakeholder interviews across the organization, speaking to key um, physicians like the CMIO, um, phys physician leaders, and even just at the base level physicians that are actually working on the floor. And from there, we got a lot of feedback as to what the pain points were with training and how it could be improved. So one of the first things that were stated was that training was too functionality based. They were spending too much time learning the intricacies of the system and not enough time learning their workflows. So as new physicians were onboarded, they would have to spend additional time with an established physician to get an idea of what the workflow was around there to make sure that they were adhering to the department culture or uh, Baptist Health's requirements for documentation. So that would elicit more time on not only the training physician side, but the established physician side to bring everyone to a happy medium. So even there, we were seeing that there were a couple of physicians who were lagging behind and not doing as well in their productivity as those who had been with the organization for a long time. Another thing was the amount of time it took. Training uh, in classroom took about eight to 12 hours. So that would be spread over the course of two days. And that was two days that they were, you know, unable to actually go into the office to work, schedule patients, things like that. Some of them had to block their calendars, et cetera, et cetera. And the same was also done for any updates to the system where they need to come back into the classroom for training. And lastly, for training leadership, they identified that they wanted more uh, robust reporting on the training itself uh, to get an idea of how they can improve uh, the efficacy of training, but also the delivery as well. Next slide, please. All right, so what was our solution? Our solution after our assessment phase was to really dig deep in, and then we came up with developing interactive e-learning solutions that would replace some, not all of the classroom training. So how we did this was that we started off by interviewing the centers of excellence per uh, each department. So these are the physicians uh, that are doing a great job, have great scores in the EMR system in terms of productivity and efficiency. And we went to go interview them to see what are the things that they do? What workflows do they follow that allows them to be top of the pack? And what we did was that we developed best practice scenarios using those workflows and enhanced the current curriculum to really provide a robust training solution that would cover not only functionality, but also provide um, glimpses into the workflows by demonstrating uh, workflow-based scenarios, all right? So we developed it, we developed content scripts and we also created, and we used those to create the interactive e-learnings. So for the content scripts, which I was one of the writers of actually, I kind of felt a little bit like Scorsese. I was, uh, you know, walking through, talking with the physicians to see how they go through their day-to-day. -day. And during this time, I was also uh, collecting key information as to how can I make this e-learning not only relevant, but also informative? So there's nothing worse than you know, going through some content and the information is not uh, relevant to what you do. So for example, let's say uh, a pediat uh, pediatric hospitalist is going through his, you know, their daily workflows, they're taking the e-learnings, and then it's an adult patient. Yes, 
functionality in the system is exactly the same, but it takes away from the immersion because when will they ever order any of the subsequent items that a regular or an adult hospitalist would order? Right? It's kind of like giving Vin Diesel an electric car in Fast and Furious. He's not going to know what to do without shifting gears. So what we wanted to do was create a situation where the content was relatable and that it was accurate as well. So with that, we tested the content consistently with the clinicians to make sure it made sense. For example, um, one of the e-learnings that I had scripted, I had giving Tylenol to a child that was like 50 milligrams in there. And the clinician came back and said, you wouldn't really do that in a real life scenario. You'd actually taper it back down to like either five or 10 milligrams, depending on the severity. Oh, perfect. Um, in another situation, I gave a patient warfarin for no reason. Another thing that they clocked that we were that we corrected through consistent meetings and um, content review sessions to make sure that the product that was delivered was relevant to the appropriate group. And as Cameron mentioned earlier, we actually started off with the hospitalist developing four modules for them, but with the onset of COVID-19, which almost two years later, can't believe I'm still saying it, we're in it, uh, we had to develop more and more content to help and assist other departments and clinicians in developing uh, their e-learning so that way their trainings were not impacted by the global pandemic. So for rehab, we established five modules. Uh, for core nursing, we actually replaced a large uh, swath of their e uh, content with eight modules of e-learnings. And then surgical staff, we created four modules. Next slide, please. Perfect. So this was also a chance for us to help improve the training and onboarding processes for physicians. Uh, originally, that was more of a manual process with the training team interfacing with the medical staff office to identify who are the new physicians that require training, keeping up with that training so that way, once the training is complete, they know when they can deploy them to their units. So we harnessed the Cornerstone LMS and using the e-learnings, we're able to actually uh, track consistently when a user has started the e-learning, what percentage they are through. And then once that is complete, uh, triggers certain communications to go to the appropriate channel. So that way the next step in the physician onboarding process is completed. And what we also did was we utilized the LMS to provide reporting on how individuals felt about the class. So using Likert scale um, surveys to really understand what they enjoyed, what they feel, what they felt could have improved and then taking that information back, either tweaking the e-learning to be more uh, relatable or turning around and um, making wholesale changes to make sure that the content is, adapt is ready for use for the population. Next slide. All right, so some of the benefits that uh, came out of this partnership included uh, flexibility for trainees and learning styles. So the interactive modules were created to mimic the actual provider workflow for a more hands-on and visual approach for those specific learners that learn the best way. Um, again, hands-on visualization. And we also created an environment of learning at your own pace on your own time. So providers could actually watch the e-learning modules you know at their home at their practices before their initial training session here on site we we're also able to uh, make the training program adaptable so we were able to adjust the onboarding content for each uh, provider specialty whether it was internal medicine uh, emergency services or surgical services for a more accurate uh, workflow based training we we're also able to increase training and support personalization. So more personalization equals less time in the EMR and more time for patient care. So focusing on the patients, which is what the providers actually want to do. And of course, less time in the EMR also equals uh, more time with family after uh, clinical hours. We were also able to uh, increase the knowledge retention due to the implementation of workflow-based content. So the providers are more confident with their EHR workflow uh, after their initial training. There's less gaps with the knowledge uh, upon the start of their first shift in a few weeks, you know, with them being on site. 
We also notice curriculum improvement. So the real life provider workflows incorporated into the curriculum for each specialty um, led into more accurate charting uh, outside of the training space. And then uh, last, we had an improved onboarding process. So this included the provider onboarding, uh, the medical staff submission to make sure that their providers had everything they needed uh, before training. And then of course, this was an improvement for the EHR trainers as well. Um, and then of course, service desk. So all of those factors that uh, Coin just mentioned played into a smoother onboarding process for the providers uh, for start to finish with their onboarding phase. Perfect, thank you, Cameron. And in addition to that, um, on the number side, we saw that for every 25 physicians that actually took the e-learnings, there was a savings of about $37,500. Because of, and this resulted as a reduction in the in-classroom training time. So for the e-learnings, you can you know, take them wherever you can take them at home while they're cooking dinner. As long as they are you know, advancing through the slides and paying attention to the content, they're able to take that on their own time. Another important thing was that they didn't have to remove themselves from as many days of working. So they didn't have to reschedule patients, block out their calendars. Um, they only needed to do that for the follow up session where they were able to customize the system or go more in depth into um, some of the complex workflows. So this was a very good way of a happy medium of addressing the time constraint of training as well as providing that um, workflow based content and training. So we also saw that there was a 50% increase in uh, the utilization of full time employees because now they weren't spending as much time training users on the basics and functionality of the system. More time was actually spent on the other end developing um, collateral that would help the physicians once they you know, made it onto on, on site. They were also able to spend more time uh, achieving follow-up sessions, scheduling follow-up sessions with physicians after they'd been working for one, two, or three weeks to ensure that they were adjusting appropriately with the new changes. And it was also an opportunity for them to attend staff meetings um, with physicians and clinicians to give them updates on the new system. In addition, we also got a few um, testimonials from the team. This, the trainers identified that students were more comfortable in their follow-up sessions because of the interactive content. So no longer did they have to handhold um, students through the class or have to watch out for those chameleons who were blending in and not paying attention uh, to the content and having to chase them down. But now they were able to have students that were more involved because they had actually practiced not only the content, but the workflows as well. So now they could ask more pertinent questions, get more deeper into the system and their customizations and getting it ready for their first day. Uh, physicians also identified that they were really, really, really happy that they were able to learn at their own pace and on their own time. A lot of times for instructor-led training classes, you're, you have a lot of people in the class and you're unable to keep everyone on the same pace because everyone has different learning levels. But with the e-learning, someone can finish it in an hour, someone can take an hour and a half, someone can take two hours because they really want to go back and learn the content. And it also it also provides the ability to return to it at any time. Once the learners assign that e-learning, they can always go back and hit the specific section that they want to do. So if a physician is unsure about how do I process an admission, they can just jump right into the e-learning, click the scroll bar to, once they've completed it, they can click the scroll bar to jump through and get to the uh, point where they can actually watch the, e, uh, the admission workflow. And lastly, as Cameron said, the informatics teams loved the improved accessibility and accountability because now they were able to see where a physician was in the onboarding process. Have they received their training? Oh, they just haven't started the e-learning. Let's send them a quick ping to uh, give them that follow-up. And then we can check in with training to see when their follow-up session is scheduled. So it allowed for a more cohesive onboarding structure with the um, for the physicians and the informatics team. So. There's a few other things that I did want to touch on. In addition to that, we also ensured that um, Baptist Health could actually continue to maintain these e-learnings after we had completed um, our set our 
work with them. So we actually trained um, two of the FTEs to be able to become e-learning developers. Uh, they were already trainers of the content already, so they were familiar with the content. All we had to do was ensure that they were able to adopt the tools that we used to establish the e-learnings. So not only were they able to create a solid base for what we have but they, that they could maintain, but they could also add on new content as well. Uh, Cameron, how many um, e-learning modules have been developed since then? So we currently have a little over 30 e-learning modules uh, currently in our LMS learning management system platform, and we currently have three that are pending to be published uh, between this month and January. Awesome. Okay. So if I'm, I think we're done with the presentation, Brittany. I think, do we have any questions? Yeah, I've got I've got one and we'll probably see a couple more trickle in here. Um, so what just recently came through is who did you work with on the clinician side to develop training workflows and content? Were there assigned uh, super users, training SMEs? So um, we wanted to make sure because of the short time frame that we had, we wanted to make sure that we were as agile as possible. So what we did was we talked to Cameron and you know we identified what the content was. And then we asked him to provide any subject matter experts, be it the trainers or clinicians. Um, and we had a mix of both. So we had the delivery side of it and then also the recipients of the training. So what we did was we worked with the trainers to establish what the content and curriculum is. And then we developed a sample workflow after and then showed it to the clinicians to make sure that it was accurate for medications and uh, dosage amounts. Um, and then additionally, we wanted to make sure that the flow was correct. So is the workflow that we're proposing actually in line with exactly what you would be doing on your first day? Great. And just to uh, piggyback off that, so current state, uh, we currently partner with our associate chief medical information officers for provider uh, e-learnings. So we have a pediatrics, ACMIO, um, internal medicine, emergency services, surgical, and uh, oncology. So every time we develop a curriculum, uh, we make sure that we uh, consult and rely on the feedback from those associate chief medical information officers just to make sure that the content is accurate based on the service line workflow. Awesome addition. Ms. Cameron, we've got a couple more um, that are, we actually have quite a flood coming in. So <laughs> I'm going to tackle two at a, or one at a time and then we'll we'll keep going until we're out of time. Uh, the next question is the physician training 100% e-learning or is there another classroom time option? So uh, current state, uh, the initial training, I would say is 75% online because we still have a few more workflows to develop in our curriculum in our uh, LMS system. But I would say by the spring of next year, the initial training will be 100% online in our LMS system. And then that will focus the classroom time for uh, personalization to uh, customize those order sets, uh, documentation notes, et cetera. Perfect. All right, next question. This is from Camilla. Um, great program and very informative. Thumbs up. Two questions. How long does it take um, for your team to develop an e-learning program? And the second question is, you mentioned the train the trainer, which I was going to inquire about. Can you talk more about the training required for train the trainer? Yes, so. Again. Oh, no problem. So I can speak to that. The development of an e-learning, depending on how long the module is, takes about three to four weeks. Um, and that's because, you know, there's a lot of different checks and balances that we have in place to ensure that uh, content doesn't have to be uh, redone after it's published. So we start off by a scripting process. We develop a script where we walk through exactly what's going to happen per slide. So are they going to click on this? Are they going to type out that? Are they going to you know, press enter or one, any, any one of those interactive elements? And then we share that with the clinicians and trainers. We have a session where we walk through and talk through all of those. And then what we do is we go in, once that is approved, we start the development process, which takes about two and a half to three weeks. And then once we have that done, we go through the first draft, make any changes, and then finalize with the, with the client or the clinicians and trainers. Um, and there was a second part to the question that I forgot, I'm sorry. 
was on mute. Uh, wondering more about um, the train the trainer. Mm -hmm. So the train the trainer, we actually have our developers works alongside the uh, FT consultants. And what we do is we ensure that, you know, we give them a curriculum on the on the key elements for creating a good and engaging in e-learning based on adult learning theory. So that includes how to draw the user in via the content using different catch-alls and key phrases and interactive elements to push them through. And then we have different levels where we have them create specific e-learning so you know the first one is hey getting your template down uh the next one would be uh sliding in content doing a screen record so screen recording the content and then putting interactive ai over the content how to sell up how to set up knowledge check questions um interactivity and things like that so that's about maybe a six to eight week process to get them um fluid and ready and then we have like different grading systems just to see where they are are they prepared are they not and then we show them how to first start off by maintaining the existing e-learnings and then walk through the development of new ones as well perfect all right, next question. What platform are you using for the e-learning development? So um, it depends. There's a few of them out there, but I think for Baptist, we are using uh, Storyline 360, which is articulate. But we've also done work using, um, I'm, ooh, I'm blanking on the other one. It's, uh, I can jump in, uh, but right now, um, as Coin just mentioned, Storyline 360 is the e-learning uh, software that we're using. However, um, once we switch over to Epic, we're going to switch over to uh, Adobe Captivate for our e-learning uh, developments. That's what it was. I didn't. Want, I, I kept thinking a C, and then I was thinking Cornerstone. But I was like, that's the LMS. <laughs> yeah. So Captivate is the other one. They're similar in some respects, but also very different in others. Um, but then the output can still be the same. All right. Perfect. The so next question is from Alex. What are the common pitfalls here, and how does your team prevent that? It's a great question. Um, so a lot of the times, uh, some of the pitfalls that we see uh, when we're developing the content is a lot of work is done before it's reviewed. And at that point, you end up going going back to make several different changes, sinking a ton of hours into uh, the development of content. And what we did was we had just checkpoints all along the process you know it would make more sense to have 30 to 40 minutes uh, to review what we have in progress than to go back and make changes once you know the screens have been recorded the ai has been overlaid the interactivity has been input and you know now you're looking at six hours worth of development time to correct those mistakes versus it could have been done during the scripting or even the initial uh drafting of the e-learning do you know of any other pitfalls, Cameron? Yeah, uh, pretty much what you said is accurate for the uh, provider onboarding pieces. Um, I will just go into like the project aspect. So since we have our e-learning program here at Baptist Health, project managers are now asking for e-learning content for provider workflows for uh, project go lives. And projects, as we know, are very fluid. So as Coin just mentioned, you could have a script that has been developed and when it's time for the review, um, someone on the project team or even a project manager may have a request for a change. And we are very upfront in the beginning, letting them know that the time that it takes to make those revisions and changes. So by that transparency, we let them know that we can make the change, but it may be a few days um, of a delay because it's not as simple as changing a PowerPoint screen. You have to go back and revise the content and the software and then republish it out for the review process and delivery. All right, guys. Next question is, can you speak more about your hypercare and post go live support? Yes, so that's a great question. Um, so after the e-learnings have gone live, we actually work alongside the training team to ensure that the first wave of individuals that are taking the courses, we monitor them closely to see, okay, how are 
they receiving the content? Are there additional changes that we need to make in between now and when the next batch of individuals uh, takes the courses? And then another thing that we would do is to monitor the reporting. So we look at the feedback on the training surveys to see, okay, what did they like? Did they like the interactivity? Was it too long? Was it, um, did it need to be broken down into smaller parts, more digestible parts that they could go through at, you know, different points in their day? So just looking out for that feedback and uh, ensuring that any changes that need to be made are made before we fully turn over and, you know, train the developers to take over from our spot. All right. All right, keeping going. Uh, what criteria did you use to determine what to convert to e-learning and what to keep as instructor-led? Great. So uh, for this, we actually worked very closely with uh, Cameron and the training team to identify from their point of view, okay, what are the simpler, more digestible portions of the curriculum that could easily be done away with that if you know you don't have to focus on them in class or they don't have a significant amount of questions from the users. So what you don't want to do is establish uh, e-learnings that require someone to explain something. So, you know, if someone comes away from the e-learning with more questions than when they went in, then that means that the content within was not suitable for an e-learning. So, for example, uh, what we would do is, hey, navigating the system and starting your first day. That's something that's, you know, easily done. You can show the setup points and things like that. What you don't want to do is go through something like, um, for example, in the ED, uh, walking someone through how to document a code or a stroke. There's a lot of different moving parts in that, and there's also a lot of uh, workflow or department specifics that you may not be able to create a broad swath for. So uh, Cameron's team was invaluable in letting us know, hey, this is the more complex stuff that we have questions about all the time. This is definitely something that we should have in the one on one or the follow up customization sessions that the uh, learners have versus, you know, the easy functionality things and the basic workflows like starting their day, logging on, documenting flow sheets and things like that. All that was eligible for e-learning development. All right, thank you. Next up. This was done in Cerner. And have you converted to Epic? That's a question, sorry. Uh, I can take that one. Yes, so right now, uh, current state, we're still on Cerner and we don't convert over to Epic until the summer of next year. So we're currently uh, still uh, creating Cerner content. However, I will say in the beginning or spring of next year, that's where we're going to go into our uh, exploration and uh, initial phases of developing the Epic content and our Adobe uh, platform for our software development. Perfect. Thank you, Cameron. OK, how do the e-learnings complement with existing vendor training materials? Yeah, I can take that one too. Yes, yeah, so I would say that the uh, e-learnings, uh, it made the workflows and training um, a lot more clear. Um, it made the process uh, easier to grasp. So right now, uh, of course, we're partnered with Cerner. Um, however, I will say that the e-learnings that are developed now are way more interactive. Um, they provide visuals that uh, the vendor really didn't provide. So those real life scenario based uh, content. So for example, um, starting off the day in the e-learning, we actually incorporate audio um, our voices in the e-learning to actually mimic a provider's voice and to provide clarification and explanations of certain workflows as the user is engaged in the e-learning and is shown where to click here or there on the screen. So what the vendor provided, you know, it gave us that general workflow or that basic knowledge, but the e-learnings that are now created are more interactive, more user-friendly, and provide those real-life examples 
that actually mimic what's going to happen real time on the floor. So once the provider is done with their e-learning training and customization sessions, once they hit the floor, everything that they're doing on the unit is literally what they learn in the e-learning. So there's no knowledge gap and the providers are actually doing what they learned in training. Awesome. Good stuff. We've got two more questions um, and no more in the queue. So I'm going to go through these, but if anybody is on the call and has a question that hasn't been covered already, now is the time to submit it. Um, thank you. We've gotten lots of really great questions and great engagement from the group, so appreciate that. Next question is, how long would it take on average for a hospitalist to complete the e-learning? Yes, so uh, current state, it will take a hospitalist on an average of five hours uh, to go through the entire like phase, but e-learning specific, it'll only take an hour and a half, two hours max. Um, the reason why we have the extra time, five hours, is because we also have our Dragon Medical One uh, e-learnings as well that's outside of Cerner, which is our voice dictation system. And then we also have our uh, customization sessions and then we also have that after support to make sure that once they start their first shift, you know, the knowledge retention is still there and they don't have any additional questions or concerns. But in total, it'll take up to two hours to complete an e-learning um, curriculum because you have everything from the fundamental uh, e-learnings that are included, which is pretty much the basic navigation. And then you have your more in-depth e-learnings, which include um, the documentations, the orders, uh, any type of additional platforms that are integrated within Cerner. We have e-learnings to cover those, such as Telemedic, which is our uh, messaging system within the health system. So pretty much anything that's covered with Cerner or outside applications integrated in Cerner is developed into a curriculum. And right now that total is averaging about two hours for completion versus the uh, typical eight hours that was uh, in place or up to 12 hours for initial training. Fantastic. Okay, last question. Thank you for the info on e-learning development. So kudos there. So with Cornerstone, are you setting up specific learner pathways to include all of the e-learnings, classes, and one-on-one -on -one sessions that they would need to take? Yes, so we are developing curriculums for each service line. Uh, that way we can pretty much include all of the e-learnings into one umbrella. So once the provider, um, we receive that notification that the provider's been credentialed, they need training set up, we assign that entire curriculum to that one provider. That way they do not have to click or manually search within Cornerstone. They have all of the e-learnings that they need to complete in one stop. And then once we receive the completion report, then we set up their customization session uh, as needed. And I believe there's a second part of that question. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, let me go back and read it again. Um, thank you for the info. OK, so with Cornerstone, are you setting up specific learner pathways to include all the e-learnings, classrooms, and one-on-one -on -one sessions? Got it. OK, yeah. And then, of course, just to uh, finish off the question, yeah, the one on one sessions, uh, those are the personalization sessions. So uh, the personalization sessions that's scheduled outside of Cornerstone. So literally just all of the e-learning modules live within the Cornerstone platform. And then once the e-learnings are complete, then we will schedule that one on one session for a personalization in the classroom. So that's outside of Cornerstone. Cool. And we did get one question in. A lot of questions on this topic. This is great. Um, how do you assess knowledge gaps or misinformation learners might have and areas of struggle with completing the e-learning? So I guess how are you um, measuring gaps in knowledge and completion of trainings? So, oh, sorry, Cameron, you want to take it? No, go ahead. <laughs> so initially what we did was we talked with the uh, training team to identify um, what any gaps were in the beginning, as well as for the uh, addressing misinformation, what we wanted to do was use the uh, workflow based approach to ensure that everyone was following the same process. So if you're what we re what we realized was that if you were just teaching the functionality, then people would just get into the system and do whatever they want to do. But 
now you have an avenue to hold them accountable to say, hey, in the e-learnings, you actually had to follow this process in order to you know, complete your admission of the um, patient. So uh, post live, actually, that's where you know the responses and the e-learnings come in, and then we can see uh, through the knowledge checks that we have in the system, are they paying attention? Are they, you know, learning the workflows as well as the functionality of the system? So the knowledge checks are a brief series of questions that um, highlight elicit points throughout the e-learning, and these were actually developed alongside the clinicians. So, for example, they were key questions about, you know, what important things to do during the workflow, or sorry, the admission workflow. Uh, what key things do you need before you discharge a patient? Uh, you know, things like how do you drop a charge and things of that nature. So, by doing all of that, we're able to see, okay, if in the and the report gives us uh, knowledge check answers to see where well someone didn't answer this correctly or they you know they spent a significant amount of time on this specific module you're able to then go in and you know through the follow-up sessions that that you have with the learner the trainers are actually going informed as to what the pain points were where they misunderstood some of the content or the workflows and then they can help mirror that together and then there's also additional sessions where you know they go back in and check on them again where they're able to see okay how are they progressing in the system this time with the actual emr data all right not to speak too soon but we don't have any more questions so final mm -hmm. call in the last couple minutes um want to thank everybody for the participation uh submitting your questions we got a lot of really great ones and I think we've done a great job of answering them all. So thanks, Coin and Cameron, for, for tackling those and getting the group what they needed out of this. It's been really, really great. Thank you guys for doing this. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Of course. All right, with that, we don't have any other questions. So I hope that everyone has enjoyed lunch during this presentation. I know Coin and Cameron are going to be having theirs after this. Um, so again, thank you so much for everything, both of you. And then for those who are on the call, we will be sending out the recorded session as well as a PDF version of the case study so that you've got um, that information at your fingertips if you need to take this to your own organizations or just want to have it um, to, to reference. So I thank you all for joining and we'll see you on the next webinar. Hey, Brittany, quick question. Yeah. Could we navigate back to the Grubhub page just in case anyone joined late and they want to see uh, how to access that or get the email. Yes, that's a great idea. Cool. So we'll leave this up for another minute or two, let everybody kind of get that information. And I'll check one last time for any questions that may have come through. Nope, we're all good. All right, gang, thanks so, so much. We're going to go ahead and end the session and we will hopefully see everybody on the next webinar and we'll send out the follow up materials in just um, less than 24 hours, assuming that the recording gets in. OK, <laughs> perfect. Thank you, everyone. Thank okay. you.